As a brown kid growing up here in Melbourne, I never heard my parents complain. Except if the Sri Lankan cricket team <laughs> failed to perform at a standard which my father deemed acceptable. And if by some egregious twist of fortune they should lose, let's just say an official day of mourning was declared in my household. But for the most part, you know, I, I never heard them complain. Because you see, they had risked quite literally everything to be here. And it was from them that I would learn what I have come to call my first lesson in the art of dreaming. Befriend risk. I was born in Sri Lanka, the pearl of the Indian Ocean, in a little village where the air is fragrant with cinnamon and jasmine, cardamom and lye, and the wild gray elephant dances the baila to the rhythm of the tropical sea. And yet, just around the time of my birth, my young parents watched in horror as the waters around us turned crimson with blood with bombs exploding in buses and schoolyards, women and children set on fire in the streets, the sweet strumming of the guitar suddenly exchanged for the stuttering of machine guns and the keening wail of curfew sirens in the night. My parents' dream was to raise their children in a world free from fear, and so they brought me and my sister here to Australia, risking everything with just a few dollars in their hands and a tremulous hope flickering in their brown eyes. In every dream, there is risk. And yet how often do we choose to play safe? You know, that familiar, well-trodden pathway. It's enticing. And yet, Dreams live in the unknown. And if we are to touch our dream, we too must step into the unknown, trusting that a bridge will be there under our feet or that our wings will be strong enough to keep us flying. My second lesson in this art of dreaming also came from mum and dad. I went to school here in the inner suburbs of Melbourne and I very quickly learned that I was different. Every day when I went out into the schoolyard, I'd hear a familiar refrain. Oi! You see that, um, you see that black kid over there? You know why he's black, mate? I'll tell you why. It's because he doesn't wash. Can't you find some soap and wash that filthy colour off your skin? What he didn't realize is that I'd go home and I'd, I'd scrub and I'd scrub. But the color never changed. And one day, I went to my father who was sitting in the living room and I said, Dad, why are we black? And my father lifted me up in his arms and put me on his knee and he said, My son, black is the beginning of everything. <laughs> when you go out at night, before those little stars open their eyes, what color is the sky? It's black. And in the womb of your Amma, before you were born, what color do you think it was there? Black. Black is the beginning. You. You're the beginning. I looked at him quizzically and said, I hope you're sure about this. <laughs> I'd later learned that my dad was paraphrasing the words of a very famous African-American poet named Sonia Sanchez. But look, I didn't know that at the time. 
All I knew was that in that moment, he had done something spectacular for me. He had taken dirt and turned it into gold. My parents were alchemists. They understood how to transform the negative scripts that we encounter every day in our lives into something beautiful. And isn't that what every dreamer is called to do? To take all that negativity that we face each day and translate it into the vibrant language of the possible. To become an alchemist, turning dust into gold. So wrapped in a garment of love woven for us by our parents, my sister and I, we walked out into the world and we started to dream. I dreamt of changing the world. I dreamt of making a difference. I dreamt of being a doctor. Now, speaking of doctors, if you ever do a Google image search on the word doctor, you'll come up with about 100 images which look a little bit like this. It's like looking in a mirror, really. I mean, <laughs> like my long lost twin, right? Um, and yet for the last 10 years of my practice of medicine, being a doctor has looked an awful lot more like this. In my final year of medical school, I bought a ticket to Africa and I found myself in the mountains of Swaziland a beautiful country with a rich tribal heritage, dignified people, jade mountains on every side, and the highest prevalence of HIV AIDS in the entire world. I was a wide-eyed final year student, and I had been schooled to that point in what I have come to describe as the arithmetic of biomedical reductionism. You take a sick patient, you add medicine, you create health. And yet somehow in those mountains all those years ago, the sums just weren't adding up. I'd see a little baby in my clinic, and he was dying of diarrhea. And that child would die, not, not because our treatment was somehow substandard, but because the local community's water source, where they were mixing his infant formula, was full of thick mud. A young woman would come to see me with AIDS. I'd give her medicine and send her home, but she wouldn't come back to get her free medicines. Not because she was lazy, but because she couldn't afford the bus fare. So she'd sit at home, deteriorate, and she'd die. So it was there in those Lubombo mountains of Swaziland that I first began to understand that there's more to health than medicine. I started talking to healthcare workers, to amazing doctors and nurses who had been working in the field for, for many decades, and they affirmed exactly what I was seeing. And as I went out into the communities and met the local people, talked to tribal elders and to community leaders, it became very clear that if we were going to make an impact into this pandemic, that we needed to reimagine medicine. We needed to burn the map of reductionism and look once again at the larger picture of health. Dreams are dynamic. They evolve, they change, or they die. Maps are awesome on paper, and yet a dream that's not eminently changeable and malleable. In the battlefield of life, that dream is destined to fail. So having burned the map, we started again in 32 little rural communities in Swaziland. And instead of just providing acute medical care, when a family was living in destitute conditions. We provided housing. When their water source was contaminated, we provided access to fresh, clean water. 
And not just that. Agricultural projects. Income generation. Reintegration of people back into their communities. We even started a choir of young people who brought the healing balm of music into the lives of those who were suffering. And what was amazing was that each day, little by little, over 10 years, I saw again and again that where medicine had failed, our organization, Possible Dreams International, succeeded. And then one day, on a little red dust road in those mountains of Swaziland, I met an old woman who changed everything for me and taught me my next lesson in this art of dreaming, surrender. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I had taken my car out for a drive in the mountains. And at the top of a very steep hill, I saw her. She was carrying a big bag of maize on her head and she was bent over. So I stopped my car and I offered her a lift. She got in, she didn't look at me, she looked straight ahead and pointed. Hamba, hamba mbili, hamba mbili, she said which means go straight. So we did. We drove that day through a very uncommon traffic of goats and little children with big buckets of, yellow, of water balanced precariously on their heads. We drove through sugarcane plantations and muddy rivers with rusted old signs that said, beware, hippos and crocodiles. We drove and drove, for two hours we drove. And finally, we came to a little series of huts where she worked, grinding a spice that she would sell at market. When I asked her how long it took her to take, make this journey by foot, she said, about five and a half hours. And then, without any warning, she told me the story of what had happened to her the night before. She said, last night, I was here at work, and my daughter, who was very heavily pregnant, gave birth. But the baby that she gave birth to was very small and struggling to breathe. And I knew Dogotela, which means doctor, I knew that I had to get him to the, to the hospital, which is at the top of the hill. So I went next door, and I borrowed a blanket, and we wrapped the baby in the blanket. And we started walking. And my daughter clutched the baby to her chest as we walked. And we walked and walked. And the night grew darker and colder. Until at some point in the middle of the night, he just stopped breathing. And then early this morning, as the sun was rising over the mountain, I buried him in the tall grass that grows outside my hut. And now, she said, now I'm walking back. I looked at her and I had no idea what to say. Finally, I said, Gogo, I can't even begin to imagine what you've just been through, but, but surely you shouldn't be going to work on a day like today. Uh, we have this organization. Maybe I can talk to your boss and, and, and get you the day off so you can go home and be with, with your family. Please, let me help you. She looked at me and she smiled. She took my hand and said, Ah, Dogotel, I'm not coming to work. I'm just coming to return the blanket that I borrowed last night. Sometimes when we talk about humanitarian aid to Africa and the developing world, the people who are being helped remain on the periphery of the story. <laughs> While the helpers are exalted, the heroes, we've got it the wrong way round. Is there anything more heroic 
They're not just living with AIDS and TB, endemic disease, but also extreme poverty, pervasive structural injustice, and still waking up each day and doing what you need to do to feed and clothe your children. So in that moment, I made a decision that once our organization was stronger and we had trained a group of local people to move our vision forward in Swaziland, that I would step aside, that I would allow international support and fundraising to remain just that, unconditional, generous support, not well-intentioned interference. Sometimes when our dream grows bigger than ourselves, we have to surrender it, to let it go. And in that act of surrender, in dethroning ourselves from the center of our dream, we allow it to find a life of its own, to find harmony with all the other dreams and all the other dreamers in this world. One of the most amazing things about this art, this art of dreaming, is that it's not restricted to the privileged few. It belongs to us all, no matter the color of our skin or our sexuality, our religion or our bank balance. Dreaming is the sovereign right of every human being. One of my favorite memories of being a little boy in Sri Lanka is when sometimes late at night, my mother and father would take me and my sister out into the garden and we'd sit together and we'd watch as the fireflies appear. Little lights dancing at midnight. When I think of humanity, I think of seven billion little points of light flung across the wounded world. Each of us burning with possibility. Each of us an artist of dreams, capable of pushing our collective story forward in some small but beautiful way. I've heard it said that change that is hammered into being is temporary, but change that is loved into being lasts. This is the art of dreaming, to love a sea into bloom, to love a wound into healing, to love the world into change. Thank you.